Tonight at 10, Donald Trump loses the support of another key Republican following the latest debate against Hillary Clinton. From the outset, there was outright hostility with Mr. Trump under pressure after his remarks about groping women, but he fought back. This was locker room talk. Uh, I'm not proud of it. If you look at uh, Bill Clinton, far worse, minor words, and his was action. But Hillary Clinton avoided discussing her husband's past and directly questioned Mr. Trump's suitability as a presidential candidate. You know, with prior Republican nominees for president, I, I disagreed with them on politics, policies, principles, but I never questioned their fitness to serve. Donald Trump is different. And tonight, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Republican Paul Ryan, has announced that he's no longer backing Mr. Trump. We'll have the latest also on the programme. Following the murder of a lecturer by a man with mental health problems, his widow calls for a change in the law. I opened the door and there were three police officers. I knew. A call from some MPs for a vote on the Brexit negotiating position is dismissed by ministers. 32 years after Orgreave, a former policeman tells the BBC that officers were briefed to use as much force as possible against striking miners. And England captain Wayne Rooney says he accepts the decision to leave him on the bench for the World Cup qualifier against Slovenia. Here, using his mobile at 50 miles an hour, a lorry driver admits dangerous driving after a mother and three children die in a crash. And more disruption on Southern Railway as guards will go on strike at midnight. Good evening. Donald Trump's campaign for the White House has been dealt a heavy blow with the news that the most senior elected Republican in the US has announced he will no longer support Mr Trump's candidacy. Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, said his priority from now on will be to protect his party's strength in Congress. The announcement followed that second televised debate between Mr Trump and his Democratic rival Hillary Clinton. It was, as predicted, an exceptionally fiery exchange as our North America editor John Sopel tells us. They walked out smiling, but as they drew closer, the awkwardness and tension were evident. No handshakes, just a wary stare. And very quickly, it was onto the now infamous comments from Trump a decade ago about molesting women. This was locker room talk. Uh, I'm not proud of it. I apologize to my family. I apologize to the American people. Women, have you ever done those things? Have respect for me. And I will tell you, no, I have not. But Hillary Clinton sought to broaden the attack on his suitability for office. And he has said that the video doesn't represent who he is. But I think it's clear to anyone who heard it that it represents exactly who he is. But it's not only women and it's not only this video that raises questions about his fitness to be our president because he has also targeted immigrants, African Americans, Latinos, people with disabilities, POWs, Muslims and so many others. And this is where it got nasty and dirty. Donald Trump chose attack as the best form of defense. He'd brought with him women who'd previously claimed to have been sexually assaulted by Bill Clinton. And Mr. Trump didn't hold back. If you look at uh, Bill Clinton, far worse, minor words, and his was action. His was what he's done to women. There's never been anybody in the history of politics in this nation that's been so abusive to women. Hillary Clinton attacked those same women and attacked them viciously. When I hear something like that, I am reminded of what my friend Michelle Obama advised us all. When they go low, you go high. Throughout the debate, Donald Trump moved nervously around the stage, sometimes as though he was stalking her, often just lurking in the background as an intimidating presence. His most effective attack was over her use of a private email server. And then this extraordinary statement. If I win, 
I am going to instruct my Attorney General to get a special prosecutor to look into your situation. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Yeah, because you'd be in jail. And then the most surreal end to this most poisonous debate. Would either of you name one positive thing that you respect in one another? Look, I respect his children. His children are incredibly able and devoted, and I think that says a lot about Donald. Uh, I will say this about Hillary. She doesn't quit. She doesn't give up. I respect that. I tell it like it is. This was a brutal and savage 90 minutes. Donald Trump had to prove that he could move beyond the sex scandal tape that has so rocked the Republican Party. He probably achieved that. He's down, but he's not yet out. There was a tepid handshake at the end, but there's no love lost between the two of them and no easing of the animosity either between Mr Trump and the deeply unhappy Republican Party leadership. John Sofu, BBC News, St Louis, Missouri. And we'll be talking to John in St Louis in just a few minutes. Uh, but so where does last night's debate leave the prospects for both candidates with under a month until Election Day? The latest BBC poll of polls looking at the five most recent national polls in the US suggest 50% of US voters backing Hillary Clinton, 44% uh, favouring Donald Trump. Both candidates are focusing attention on around 10 of the swing states, stretching from Nevada in the west uh, to Florida in the southeast. Uh, there are also key states which the candidates must retain. Arizona, for example, uh, that is one that Donald Trump needs to keep in Republican hands if he is to win this presidential election. So my colleague James Cook went to speak to some of the voters in Arizona about last night's debate. In more than 60 years, Arid Arizona has voted for a Democratic president only once, when Bill Clinton won here in 1996. If his wife can repeat the feat, it will be thanks to Donald Trump's scorched earth approach to politics. We saw that but the tycoon's tough talk went down well in Wilbur's Grill. Republican voters here loved seeing their candidate lay in to Hillary Clinton. He may have boasted about sexual assault, but they say she's worse. She has gone after Bill Clinton's victims and mistresses, so she cannot stand on a pro-woman leg when she has been quite anti-woman. If you're talking about what his words are about a woman versus what Hillary Clinton and her husband have done to women, that is what is important. I believe that after tonight's performance in particular, that he's probably gained support and um, I still have complete confidence in him. But there is a big problem. This dry and dusty state is increasingly diverse and increasingly democratic. Tucson now feels like a blue island in a Red Sea. And the Democrats at this classic car rally are hopeful. No, I'm not a fortune teller, I wish I was, but I really have a good feeling about it because uh, we have a lot more people moving into the state. Ma'am, what do you think of uh, Donald Trump? Like, for real? Yeah. It, I'm ashamed that he is actually the Republican nominee, and I really hope that he steps down. I won't vote for him. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Uh, I think he's, he's kind of against Hispanic people here in the United States. The Contreras family has been grilling here for more than two decades. In that time, Arizona's Spanish-speaking population has shot up. Latino turnout is usually low, but if it rises, Mr. Trump could be badly burned. Not yet by Latinos, in general. Mm. Women? Women, eh? the Muslims. It doesn't help Mr. Trump that he's been deserted by party leaders, with neither of the state's Republican senators backing him. Donald Trump's core supporters seem pretty pleased with his performance, but the Republican Party here in Arizona and across the United States remains bitterly divided, concerned about both the messenger and the message. And with less than a month to go, that can only be good news for Hillary Clinton. James Cook, BBC News, Tucson. Well, let's go live tonight then to St. Louis and John Sopel's there, our North America editor. We mentioned Speaker Paul Ryan and his decision, John. How significant do you think that'll turn out to be? 
very. Paul Ryan is the most senior elected Republican in the country. He was furious at the weekend over Donald Trump's comments from a decade ago. And today he's effectively cut him adrift and the Republican leadership has done that too. And that's not just saying we're not going to support you. There are logistical and financial consequences to that. They're going to move money away from the Trump campaign and put it into Senate and Congress races because they want to keep control of the Senate. And polls would seem to vindicate that judgment. The latest poll today shows Hillary Clinton 11 points ahead. The last time that happened was in 1996, just as we were hearing in James Cook's report, when Bill Clinton won Arizona. They abandoned Bob Dole and left him to fend for himself. Bob Dole took it quietly. It's far from clear that Donald Trump will take it lying down. John, thanks very much again. John Sopel there with the latest after that debate in St. Louis. The widow of a lecturer who was stabbed to death in North London by a man who was mentally ill has called for concrete changes in legislation to prevent such killings in future. Dr Yeroen Ensing, who was 41, was attacked last December as he went to post letters announcing the birth of his daughter. Femi Nendap, who was a Nigerian student, had been arrested months earlier for wielding a knife in public and for assaulting a police officer, but the charges against him had been dropped just days before the attack. Our correspondent Michael Buchanan has this report. I've never thought I could love the way I loved him. He was the, the most amazing man ever. Giron Ensink was an acclaimed engineer, an expert in water and sanitation projects in the developing world. Last December, he left his flat to post some cards, announcing the birth of his first child. A daughter, Fleur, had been born 11 days earlier. Within metres of his home, he was killed, stabbed repeatedly by a man he'd never met. And there was a knock on our door and I opened the door and there were three police officers. I knew. Obviously I had no idea what had happened, but I knew something awful's happened. This is Jerome's killer, Femi Nandap, a 23-year-old Nigerian student with severe mental health problems. He admitted manslaughter by diminished responsibility. At his sentencing hearing today, the court heard Nandap was suffering from psychosis brought on by cannabis use and referred to himself as the Black Messiah at the time of the stabbing. In May last year, Nandap was arrested and charged with wielding a knife in public and attacking a police officer. He was released on bail. In October, he stopped taking his antipsychotic drugs. In December, the charges against him were dropped, just six days before he killed Dr. Ensing. If a person with a history of mental health problem is found wandering about with a knife and attacks a police officer, then that person must be referred to a secure unit for proper assessment and treatment and not given bail so easily. Prosecutors say today it was a mistake to drop the charges against Femi Nandap, but maintained the decision would not have saved Jerome Mensing's life. The African Studies student has now been sent to a high security hospital indefinitely. The utterly random nature of Jerome Mensing's killing has forced the family to return back to the Netherlands. As the judge said in court today, there is a dreadful irony here that a man who devoted his life to helping people he'd never known or meet was killed by a complete stranger. Mental health patients kill about 60 people a year, a figure that's been broadly stable in recent years, but that's of little comfort to this family. It's taken me a month. I think it was in, in March when it was the first time that I actually realised that he isn't coming back. It's final. It's, he's never ever coming back. He'll, he'll never meet his father. The judge said that had Jerome Ensing lived, his work could have improved the lives of millions. Michael Buchanan, BBC News, North London. The BBC has learned that Saudi Arabia has privately accepted that one of its own fighter jets bombed a funeral in the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, at the weekend. At least 140 people were killed, most of them civilians, and more than 500 injured in one of the worst atrocities in the two-year-long war there. Saudi Arabia is also said to have agreed to a British request to participate in the investigation into the attack. 
Police in Germany say they believe a Syrian refugee who was arrested this morning was very close to completing preparations for an attack. Jaber al bakr was found in Leipzig following a manhunt over the weekend. He fled from a flat on Saturday where explosives were discovered. Officers think that he'd been in contact with so-called Islamic State. Now, a growing number of MPs are calling for a parliamentary vote on the government's negotiating position for leaving the European Union. The former Labour leader, Ed Miliband, said it was essential that Parliament be given a say, given the momentous nature of the decisions being made. But Downing Street has rejected the idea of a vote on the negotiation, while hinting that Parliament could be given an opportunity to approve the final Brexit deal. This report from our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, does contain some flashing images. Small talk before a big job ahead. I apologise for the rain, says the Danish Prime Minister. She is used to that. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity. And making polite conversation comes with the job. FaceTime with foreign leaders, she needs to get on side. The UK is leaving the EU, but we're not turning our back on Europe. But no new clues on how she'll lead us out. And at home, demands are stirring from MPs for a say on the kind of bargain the government will pursue, from familiar faces and party after party. On the basis of what constitutional principle does he believe that the Prime Minister can now arrogate to herself the exclusive right to interpret what Brexit means, impose it upon the country, rather than protect the rightful role of scrutiny and approval of this House? Where is the government's mandate for its negotiations, either from this House or the country. It would be wholly unacceptable for the British public to find out what the UK's position in those negotiations is from our counterparties in the negotiations. We may be no clearer on if this is a soft Brexit or a hard Brexit. We do know that it's a dog's Brexit. Despite accusations even from some Tories that it's undemocratic, ministers are firm. We will reject any attempt to undo the referendum result, any attempt to hold up the process, unduly, or any attempt to keep Britain in the EU by the back door by those who didn't like the answer they were given on June 23rd. But the opposition won't give up. It seems that the government wants to draw up negotiating terms and reach a deal without any parliamentary approval. That is not making Parliament sovereign. That is sidelining Parliament. The Prime Minister's not budging for now, reluctant to give way or to shed more light on her strategy. Sources have told me a green paper, a rough draft of the government's ideas for Brexit, was planned but has now been junked. Downing Street denies it, but there's no question there's a growing thirst for more information. Making new friends around Europe, she'll need everyone. My new British colleague, so happy to see you. However much Theresa May presses the flesh, Leaving the EU won't be easy, at home or away. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. Well, the British retail consortium has urged the government to put consumers first during Brexit by protecting against the rise in tariffs, which would make imports more expensive, it would drive up uh, prices in the shops. There's also set to be a 5p increase in the price of a litre of petrol and diesel by the end of this month due to the falling pound and the, the rise in oil prices. Our business editor Simon Jack reports now from Merseyside. Retailers presented their post-Brexit stall today. As the biggest importer of goods in the UK, the sector would be hard hit by any rising costs. But here in Birkenhead and Merseyside, most traders and shoppers were unconvinced about the threat. We buy a lot of flowers. So if they want to put tariffs on our cars, we'll put tariffs on their flowers. We won't sell their flowers, we'll buy English flowers instead. They're going to want to do, do the deals as much as we do. It definitely wasn't um, made obvious to the, the public that you know the prices of daily things or gifts etc would go up, um, but I think it should have been something everyone should have considered definitely. Once outside, the UK might have to fall back on its membership of the World Trade Organization, which comes with its own rulebook. Currently, meat moves between the EU and the UK tariff-free. WTO rules could impose tariffs of up to 40%. Chilean wine flows in with no tariff. Outside the EU, it's 14% on top.
but clothes from India arrive in the EU with 12% already added. Under special rules for developing countries, we could opt to do a deal reducing that. First choice, of course, would be new trade deals, both with the EU and the rest of the world. But experts warn that is easier said than done and takes time. The government's in a difficult position. Certainly with trade, it's going to be quite difficult to keep prices low. They may have alternative policy options available to them, but on trade, they're going to just have to get out there, get on top of it as quickly as they can, hire good international trade negotiators, and fight to try to get as low a tariff barriers as they can. It's too soon to know exactly what, if any, tariffs will be imposed on imports coming into places like Liverpool. The WTO rules are not the government's preferred option, but they are, of course, a possibility. But one thing seems certain, shoppers may have to get used to higher prices, if only because of the fall in the value of the pound, which makes imports coming here from the US and from Europe that bit more expensive. And that gives rise to another cloud. Petrol retailers warn today that fuel priced in dollars could see an imminent rise of five pence a litre, pushing transport costs up and incomes down. Deal or no deal, retailers and consumers could face tougher times ahead. Simon Jack, BBC News, Merseyside. One of the bloodiest days in modern British industrial history took place 32 years ago during the year-long miners' strike when thousands of police officers clashed with miners in the village of Orgreave in South Yorkshire. A former policeman has now told the BBC that officers were briefed to use as much force as possible against the miners. The government is considering a review into what happened on that day. Our correspondent Dan Johnson has this exclusive report. It was the ugliest moment in a fractious year. Two sides grappling for control. At stake for the miners, their industry, their jobs. For the government, a threat to law and order, the police had to resist. Now, 32 years on, for the first time, a claim officers were ordered to use violence. And lining This up. former constable was amongst the ranks, briefed by senior officers. He wants to remain anonymous to protect his family, but he's willing to give evidence if there is an inquiry. They just emphasised the fact that they wanted to make sure that if there was any trouble at all, that it was, you know, that we needed to stamp it out straight away, and that uh, you know to use as much force as possible. To use as much force as possible. Well, yes, yeah, certainly if they cause a, a, any sort of disorder, they're basically, I felt, they've given us a sort of licence to say, you know, we can do what we want, and which I didn't feel was right. This is the video the police recorded, picking up a senior officer's instruction to use force. No heads, bodies only. An order that didn't reach everyone. These trucks were the miners' target. Lines of police made sure they could get through. The violence went both ways, no doubt, and some feel the miners gave as good as they got. They think that it was their right to use violence to stop people from going to work. It wasn't. It's clear what's the problem. The problem for them is that they lost their battle, a violent battle, to overthrow the rule of law. But others still want answers. Who was to blame for the standoff erupting into a running battle? And did the police use excessive force? I just got to just got to bridge. I couldn't run no When more. officers charged, Stefan Wazowski was amongst 95 miners arrested, accused of throwing a stone. They uh, bounced me on the riot shields, busted my face. The shields opened, and it was a free for all there. The uh, they knocked ten bells of crap out on me, kicked me, punched me, elbowed me. It's not just brutality the police stand accused of. Many of the miners were charged with riot. Now, that's a serious offence. It could have meant a long prison sentence. To prove it, the police needed convincing evidence. But there are questions about the way that evidence was gathered. In their statements, many officers used the same phrases again and again. As we stood there in the line, as we stood there in the line, a continuous stream of missiles, missiles came. The police the ranks were now under the police attack. ranks were now under constant attack, and the pickets were approaching aggressively. Under cross examination, one policeman said there were a number of officers from the serious crime squad 
who dictated the first bit of this statement. Those detectives were following the chief constable's orders that charges of unlawful assembly and riot should be preferred for arrested minors. But the case collapsed and the miners were cleared. We have the names of the five serious crime squad detectives. When we approached them, two didn't respond, the others denied any wrongdoing over the statements. South Yorkshire Police says the force recognises the impact of Orgreave's unanswered questions and will cooperate fully with any inquiry. There was no loss of life here, no miscarriage of justice, and yet, there are those who say they're still waiting for the truth. Dan Johnson, BBC News, Orgreave. Let's have a, a brief look then at some of the day's other news stories. A lorry driver who killed a mother and three children in a crash in Berkshire has pleaded guilty to four counts of causing death by dangerous driving. Tomasz Kroker from Poland was using his mobile phone at the time of the crash. A 15-year-old boy has admitted the murders of Liz and Katie Edwards in Lincolnshire at the start of a trial at Nottingham Crown Court. The bodies of the mother and daughter were found at their home in Spalding in April. A 15-year-old girl has admitted manslaughter but denies murder. Samsung's Galaxy Note 7 smartphone is still prone to catching fire despite a recall to fix a battery problem. The company's stopped production while it looks at what is going wrong. Now, American intelligence officials have accused Russia of trying to influence the outcome of the US presidential election by deploying cyber attacks to destabilize the political system. Concern about Russia's increasingly aggressive use of cyberspace has also been growing in the European Union, especially after a French television channel was taken off air last year. Our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera, has been investigating. This weekend, the US made an extraordinary claim that Russian hackers were trying to influence the race for the White House. American spies say only senior Russian officials could have authorised the hacking of computers at the Democratic Party headquarters down the road in Washington. The result was an embarrassing leak of emails and resignation of the party's chairwoman. President Obama voted early using an electronic voting machine and there is evidence hackers, perhaps Russian, have tried to get inside these type of systems. The only reason I can see why you would want to do that is to sow doubt about the outcome of the election because if you are in a district where you have to rely on the voting machines and you know the voting machine, the database has been penetrated. Can you really trust the result? It's not just America that's been worried. Here in Britain, during the general election campaign last year, there were fears that broadcasters, including the BBC, could be targeted by Russian hackers. That fear was because a French TV network last April was taken off air in a sophisticated cyber attack. Uh, in France. Ah, okay. The director general of TV Saint Mon showed me round the Paris control room, which runs 12 global channels. Last year, all the screens went dark as a computer virus started destroying the systems. And all of a sudden, everything went dark. And then the people in charge of digital uh, said, well, but we have also, we have better us, we are not down, but we have uh, threatening messages on Facebook, on our Twitter accounts and uh, on our websites. The messages claim to be from so-called Islamic State, but intelligence officials now believe it was Russia testing its cyber weapons. Russia appears willing to take more risks using its hackers. The question for Washington and others is how to respond. Gordon Carrera, BBC News. Some football news then, and the England captain Wayne Rooney has been uh, left on the bench for tomorrow's World Cup qualifier against Slovenia. It comes after he was booed by some fans during the team's victory over Malta on Saturday. But the interim manager, Gareth Southgate, says the decision is tactical rather than a reflection of form. Our correspondent, Andy Swiss, has more details. He was once unstoppable and undroppable, not anymore. In Slovenia tonight, Wayne Rooney out on the pitch 
but tomorrow he'll be starting on the sidelines after a performance at the weekend which drew audible criticism. This is a few brews and jeers. Yeah. Tonight, Rooney faced the media alongside Gareth Southgate, the new boss who just dropped his captain. I understand and respect the manager's decision. It's football I've played 13 years, um, non-stop for England, give everything. And um, a time comes where, you know, the manager, you, you're not the first name on the team, sheet, which I have been in the past. While Jordan Henderson will lead the team tomorrow, Rooney will remain captain long term, according to the manager. So why was he dropped? Not an easy decision to take because of the respect I have for him as a player, as a person, as a captain of this team. Um, but, it, you know, um, we felt it was the right decision to, uh, to go with the, the team that we're starting with. Rooney's form this season has come under increasing scrutiny. His club, Manchester United, have dropped him and now his country has followed suit. So is this the beginning of the end for one of English football's biggest stars? It's down to him. If he chooses maybe to retire um, at some point, um, that's up to him. But he said he wants to get to you know, the World Cup. And for her husband's critics, a message today from Colleen Rooney. Lighten up, life is short, give people a break. Some forget others have feelings too. But for a man who's lived and played in the spotlight, recapturing that magic could be his toughest challenge yet. Andy Swiss, BBC News. Quick reminder, news now is coming up on BBC Two. Here's Evan. Tonight, we'll take you through a cache of fascinating documents we've obtained from Royal Bank of Scotland, which they don't want you to see. It's all about them making money from small firms in financial distress. Join me now on BBC Two, 11pm in Scotland. That's uh, Newsnight with Evan here on BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.